Good morning, church. Today's scripture reading is found in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Verse 1, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of God. Verse 3, remember then what you received and heard, keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Verse 6, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. May God bless the reading of his word. I suppose um, a number of us have watched the movie Train to Busan. Um, it is one of the best zombie movies ever made. It not only brings out a different aspect of humanness, humanness powerfully, it forces one to reflect over certain social and political issues. Of course, the movie scares you to death with a train load of zombies. But do you know what? Do you know what is a lot scarier? That is a church full of zombies, not a train full of zombies. A church of the living dead. A church of the living dead is not a movie. It is very real. It has a deadly effect and it can go after people and turn them into zombies. And it can spread death in the church instead of life. And today, we want to look at a church that Jesus rebuked, a church of the living dead. Let us look at verse 1 again. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Notice that there was no mention of the church losing its first love, like uh, um, the church in Ephesus. There was no mention of church tolerating false teachings. And there was no mention of sexual immorality in the church. Jesus did not rebuke the church like what he did to the other churches. How remarkable, right? But what is important is not what Jesus did not say, but rather what he did say. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of the church, does not go by outward appearance. He is not impressed by the church buildings. He is not impressed by the activities of the church. He is not impressed by the numbers, by the attendance of the church. Look at what Jesus said. What he was saying is this, I know your works, your worship, your ministry, all the activities but they are unacceptable to me. You look alive, but you lack the thing that matters most, life. Others think that you are strong, but I see your inward condition. You are dead, living, but dead. What went wrong with the church? What went wrong? How could a church that had a reputation of being alive get to the point of being dead? 
how could a healthy church become a dying church? A, big, a bit of uh, background story here. Already in the 7th century BC, Sardis was the capital of the wealthy and powerful Lydia Empire. The Acropolis was built on a 450 meter high mountain, about three times, three times the height of Bukitima. And the mountain, the Acropolis, was surrounded three sides by steep cliffs. No way anybody could take down the Acropolis, could take down the, the city at all. In 549 BC, Cyrus, king of Persia, we know about him, uh, he was the one who later conquered Babylon and uh, allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the temple first. Besieged the city, besieged the Acropolis, but without success. A Persian soldier, and um, a Persian soldier was looking at the city, looking at the Acropolis, and he studied diligently uh, the topography and waited and observed patiently for 14 days. And one day, he saw a soldier, uh, a Lydian soldier on top of the mountain um, drop his helmet over the battlements. And that soldier, Lydian soldier, climbed down from the battlement all the way down to the hill pick up, recover the helmet, and climb back up. So, what happened was this. That Persian soldier brought a group of people, a man, a group of men, following the steps of the Lydian soldier who dropped his helmet up the cliffs. And when they reached the top, they found the walls of Sardis completely unguarded. The guards were sleeping. So the man entered unopposed and opened the gate from the inside. Sardis was taken. And guess what? About 200 years later, history repeated itself. At that time, the Greek king Antiochus, Antiochus, or Antiochus, Antiochus the Great besieged the city for over a year, could not take down the city. Then one of his soldiers, a, a very smart soldier, observed the Acropolis and he noticed that on one side, a very steep wall of the city, birds would rest on that place. Birds would always come to that side of the city, of the wall. So he concluded that side must be unguarded. So on one moonless night, this Greek soldier brought a group of people up the mountain on that particular site. And guess what? When they entered, the entire city was unguarded again. The guards were sleeping. Again, the guards were sleeping. And again, the people entered the city unopposed and then opened the gate from the inside. And the mighty city was again taken. Twice, not once, the impenetrable city was taken because the people were too complacent. Church, the tragedy of life is not found in failure, but in complacency. It was in this background that our Lord Jesus said, you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Spiritual slumber is the root cause that leads to spiritual death. Apparently, there was a mismatch between their reputation and, their, and the reality, between what they claimed to be and what they actually were. They had the reputation of being Christians. But their Christianity was in name only. Sad to say. They had the appearance 
of godliness but without substance. When Jesus looked into their hearts, he was not at all impressed. How could a healthy church become a dying church? When we focus on church traditions and activities more than our walk with the Lord, we are in danger of death. When we pursue material wealth more than spiritual health, we are in danger of death. When we are restless in life and find no rest in church life, we are in danger of death. When we complain to one another instead of encouraging one another and sharing the gospel, we are in danger of death. I can go on and on when we are in danger of death. But my point is this, church. When we care less about our, our identity, about who we are, we lose our authenticity of being who we really are. Now let me repeat. When we care less about our identity, about who we are, we lose our authenticity of being who we really are. Jesus said in verse 2, Wake up, wake up, and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Oh, this is not about waking up from sleep, mind you. It is not the same as your mom shouting at you, Wake up, it's time for church. It is not like your wife elbowing you and whispering, wake up, people are watching. No, this is a wake-up call. It is about being on the alert in constant watchfulness about being alive again. You see, many years before the book of Revelation was written, Sardis was one of the most important cities of Asia Minor. But it had fallen farthest from its past glory. Even 200 years after the last city, the last time the city was taken, it was rebuilt during the time of Jesus. But its citizens continued to live in their past glory. Likewise, the church in Sardis during the time of Jesus, after Jesus ascended to heaven, after the apostle founded the church, after many years, the church continued to live in its past glory. It had its glory days, but now they continue to live off the past greatness, instead of living now for Jesus. What went wrong? What went wrong? I think this is a question that we have to come back again and again and ask ourselves, what went wrong? What happened to a church, a church that is living, that had become a dying church, a church of the living dead. It was said once, Alexander the Great caught a soldier who was fearful of fighting in battle. Alexander the Great caught the soldier before him and said, and asked him, what is your name, soldier? The soldier replied, I am Alexander. What is your name? I am Alexander. What is your name? I am Alexander. Alexander the Great said, Wake up, soldier. That is my name. You either live up to it or change your name. That is what 
the Lord is saying to us, wake up church, live up to my name or don't call yourself Christian. The verb to wake up is often used with being vigilant, preparing oneself for the return of Jesus Christ. But do you notice it is used here with several verbs to strengthen, to remember, to keep, and to repent. Look at verse 3. Remember then what you receive and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Look, what a church of the living dead needs is not new idea, some new idea or some new technique. No. What a church of the living dead needs is to remember the gospel message. It's to remember our Lord Jesus. It's to return to His teaching. It's to abide in Him. It is to keep His teaching. Renewal of a dead church cannot happen without responding to God's word in, with obedience and repentance. The COVID-19 challenge in the past two years is unprecedented. We all know it. It has caused enormous trauma and it has disrupted all areas of our life. And it has challenged the church of God globally and it has shaped our faith in ways unimaginable for good and for bad. Recently, a friend of mine told me that in the last two years, he had buried more than 60 members in his church. More than 60 in people in the last two years. I said, oh no, that must be extremely depressing. Of course, COVID-19 is not the only reason that caused many Christians to sleep in the Lord. But for sure, COVID-19 has put many Christians to sleep in the church. And that is very troubling. Are you one of them? Are you one of them? Do you see the darkness in your soul? Do you feel the dryness in your services? Do you smell the deadness in your life? It is only when we truly see our conditions will we be able to see the hope of revival. The first step in revival is to see how badly we need it. It is time for us to wake up and realize that life does not wait for us. If we don't wake up, if we continue to sleep, we will sleep the sleep of eternal death. Judgment will come upon us unexpectedly. Look at the second part of verse 3. If you will not wake up, Jesus said, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come. Listen carefully here. Against you. In the Bible, the return of Christ like a thief will only always terrify the unbelievers, the nominal Christians, the living dead. Notice that the verb to wake up the command occurs first, verse 2, and then last, verse 3, second part. After the entire, the string of command, wake up, wake up, wake up if you don't wake up. This verb, to wake up, exposes how dead 
the church was. Wake up. But you know, the letter to the church in Sardis was not directed to Sardis, the church in Sardis only, but it is also speaking to us. And what do you think about our church? Is our church a lively one or a lifeless one? Ask yourself, when you knew and pray the Lord's Prayer every Sunday, is there life in it? When you sing praises, do your hearts, do our hearts follow the songs we sing? When we recite the Apostles' Creed, are we on fire or do we feel cold and formal and indifferent? How do you feel when you come into the house of God or sit before the screen to worship? How do you feel? Do you really sense the presence of God in your life? May the Spirit of God convict us, strike us from above like a lightning bolt and shock us, shock us up back to our senses. We need that. Um, in the old days, um, the doctor would hold the, leg, uh, the newborn baby upside down and swat the butt. Uh, am I right? Uh, I was told in the old days, in the movies, we always see that the doctor would hold the baby upside down and swat the butt. Why? Why did the doctor do that? To, to make them feel sorry for coming into this world? Or to get them used to spanking? Of course not. It is to get them to breathe the first breath. I think we need the SWAT. Not the SWAT team, but the SWAT from the Lord to jerk us up, to jerk us awake so we can breathe again. And Jesus promises us, saying in verses 5 and 6, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Not to the church in Sardis, but to the churches. During the time of Jesus, white garments symbolize purity, eternal life, salvation, and immortality. That is why during that time, the dead would always be wrapped in white cloth. But it is even more special when the living puts on the white garment. To put on a white garment is not merely a future reward, no. It is a present experience of walking with Jesus. Look at verse 4. This is one very comforting, very encouraging verse. Verse 4. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. How wonderful. Have you heard about, um, heard of a, a funeral called White Funeral? Some African tribes have a tradition of portraying the idea of salvation. At baptism, they would burn their old clothing and put on a white robe. And I call that baptism a white funeral in which they buried their old life with the burning of the filthy garment, garments and resurrected, resurrected 
to a new life with the putting on the white garment. We all have gone through the white funeral, right? And now, since we have gone through the white funeral, what's next is that we shall walk with Jesus. We shall walk with Him and towards Him. We shall walk from strength to strength. We shall walk with Him in purity, in honour, and in victory. That is His promise to us, church. But the Lord also promises us that He will not blot our names out of the book of life. In ancient Greece, ancient Athens, when a citizen was sentenced to death, his name would first be removed from the official government record and then he would be executed. But in Singapore, it is opposite. We die first, then we surrender our IC. Back then, it's different. They remove your name and then they execute you, executed you. And because of that idea, removing from the registry, um, government record, and then be executed, the whole idea caused people to um, come out with, with kind, one, some kind of um, conclusion uh, saying that Christians who have failed in their walk would have their names blotted out of the book of life and then they would, be, they would lose their salvation. Have you heard about that? I, I think so. But I want to tell you that the text here, the text here is not about eternal security. The text here is not about once saved, forever saved. No, the text is not about this. I know there are people who actually, actually um, buried their dead with their baptism certificate so that the person, the dead person, could go to heaven bringing the baptism certificate and maybe to, to let Peter see, oh, this is my baptism. I am part of this, this registry, you know, the book of life. But no, the text here is not about eternal salvation. No. It is not about one saved, forever saved. No. You see, in, in all the seven churches, there are two more uh, that we will talk. Uh, two more that we will talk about uh, next few weeks. In all the seven churches, the promise Jesus gave to each church, though different, have the, had the same condition. Each promise would always begin with the phrase, "The one who conquers," without exception, and regardless of the situation of the church. Look at the promise Jesus gave to the church in Smyrna, a church that received great commendations from Jesus. Look at verse 11, chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 11, especially the second part. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. When we look at that verse, we cannot conclude, therefore, that the one who does not conquer will be hurt by the second death, right? Likewise, the promise given to the church in Sardis does not contain the threat of losing one's salvation. In fact, all the promises given to the seven churches are stated, stated in positive terms and there is no indication of the danger of losing one's salvation. When Jesus said, I will never blot his name out of the book of life. It is, in fact, an affirmation of eternal security. And more importantly, in the book of Revelation, whenever John mentioned the unbelievers, he never associated them with the book of life, but only with the book of judgment. Let me give you two examples. Verse uh, chapter 20, verse 12. Chapter 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead, 
great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Then another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And then the same chapter, verse 15, a few verses later, verse 15, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. They are condemned because their names are not written in the book of life, not because of their names being blotted out of the book of life. You see the difference? Waking up from your spiritual slumber is the evidence that your name is recorded, recorded in the book of life. So wake up, church. Wake up. It is the evidence that you, your name, is recorded in the book of life. And Jesus further said, I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. This is the last of the threefold promise. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. How comforting. We are guilty of many sins. But our God looked deeper and He sent Jesus to us. Jesus went to the cross so we didn't have to go there. Jesus paid for our sins so we didn't, we didn't have to die for our sins. And the best part is this, before the heavenly Father and before all the heavenly hosts, Jesus declares, my father, this defiled person, this wretched sinner, this unworthy guy, he is mine. I have redeemed him. He is now mine. You see, when God looks at you, he sees his child. You are extremely precious before the Lord. You are always God's child, no matter how old you get and no matter what you have become. Because Jesus says, you are His. The Spirit of God is convicting you and does not let you go because Jesus says, you are His. Jesus calls his father, my father, who is now always also our father, your father in heaven. Because Jesus says, you are his. You are Christian, not because of how Christian you look from the outside, but because Jesus says, you are his. You are a Christ person. Live up to your name or don't call yourself a Christian. About every 500 years, the Christian church went through a revolution. About roughly 500, every 500 years. Every 500 years, sleeping Christianity is shattered so that there will be renewal and new growth. The first wake-up call was 500 years after the birth of the church and the expansion of Christianity. In the 6th century, the Roman Empire fell. Christianity and Rome had a complicated relationship. With the, with the end of the Roman Empire, Christianity found itself a new territory reaching out to the non-Greek and the non-Roman. That was the first time, the first wake-up call. The second 500 year was the great schism between Eastern Orthodoxy 
and Western Roman Catholicism. For the first time, the church was split, not because of heresies, but because of internal misunderstanding. And that was the second wake-up call. Then, in the third 500 year, came the Great Reformation. It was no longer the division of the West and the East between the Catholic and the Orthodox church, churches. In the third wake-up call, the Reformation ushered in a time, a period of personal relationship with God and a deeper commitment to the Word of God. And then, the next 500 years, which was the beginning of Y2K, it brought about a reformation of a whole new way of doing church. Church, we are in this fourth wake-up call. Today, the spread of Christianity, the spread of the gospel message is unprecedented. Today, Christianity is the largest religion in the world. But do you know how many nominal Christians there are? 1.2 billion. 1.2 billion nominal Christians, which is half of the number of the Christian population. 50% of Christians are nominal. There is, that is a wake-up call for all of us. History tells us that the Lord of the church will not allow His church to fall asleep. The Lord will shatter. He will shake. He will shape His church to bring about renewal and new growth. The question we ask is not, how could a healthy church become a dying church? That is not our question. Our question should be, how could a church of the living dead become a church of the living saints? Wake up, wake up church, lest you sleep the sleep of eternal death. Wake up, see the darkness in your soul. Wake up, feel the dryness in your services. Wake up, smell the deadness in your life. And wake up, hear the declaration of Jesus. My father, this defiled person, this wretched sinner, this unworthy guy, he is mine. So, church, wake up. Come, come home, come home. Come to Jesus. Let us pray. Oh Lord, you are the one who has the fullness of the Holy Spirit and you are the one who are in control of your church, of our life. You know our condition and you know our weaknesses. May your word plunge deep in our hearts. May your spirit convict us to live our life for you. And may our walk with you be authentic and pleasing before you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.